Dr. Zoe Harcombe is a prominent figure in the field of public health nutrition, ardently questioning and challenging long-held dietary beliefs. Having embarked on her investigative journey in the late 1980s, she delved into the perplexing paradox of the rising obesity rates juxtaposed with society's intense desire for slimness. The exponential growth in obesity statistics statistics during the final decades of the 20th century fueled her passion. A proud alumna of Cambridge University, Zoe achieved this academic pinnacle as the first from her state school where she studied mathematics and economics on a scholarship. Her publishing journey began in 2004 with Why Do You Overeat When All You Want to Do Is Be Slim, a book which resonates profoundly with readers. Furthering her real food advocacy, she released Stop Counting Calories and Start Losing Weight in 2008 alongside a recipe book. Dr. Harcom, with a doctorate focused on dietary fat recommendations, consistently contributes to research in nutrition, diet, and obesity with her extensive works, media appearances, and writings underscoring her unwavering commitment to, uh, to counteract the obesity epidemic. Welcome, Zoe. I'm so happy to have you here. <laughs> that was so nice. That was so nice. Like, I said, I'm just going to go now. That was so nice. That's made my day. Thank you. Well, I have to tell you, I had like this this bio, and it was literally like three paragraphs long. I was like, "How do I cut <laughs> down?" Absolutely, like all the amazing things about this woman into this one intro paragraph. So that was it. It was I tried really hard to cut it down and still do you justice. Oh, bless! You should just say she's really short and really choksy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my hubby would say. Pocket oh, Rocket no. is my nickname. Oh, you are definitely powerful and you are small in stature, small but mighty for sure. Thank you. So today we are going to talking about talk about common myths in the space. So the first one I have is, you know, how did this misconception that meat is full of saturated fat originate and what are the facts? Oh my goodness, I see dietitians <laughs> talking about this one on the television and I'm just screaming at the television there. They're like, oh, you can't eat meat, it's full of saturated fat. So let's just quickly whiz through some facts about fat because these are absolutes and these are just not widely known. So the only food that I can find on the planet that has not a trace of fat whatsoever is sucrose, table yeah. sugar. So even lettuce and salad vegetables have a trace of fat. I mean, you'd have to eat an extraordinary amount of lettuce to ratch up any kind of fat intake, but virtually every food has a trace of fat. So first of all, you start saying, well, how come fat would be so bad for us if, if there's fat in everything? Second really important fact about fat is that the only food group that has more saturated than unsaturated fat is dairy products as a food group. So you think of food groups as meat, fish, eggs, dairy products, whole grains, legumes, that's beans and pulses, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. So the only one of those groups that has more saturated than unsaturated fat is dairy products. Now, yes, you've got individual foods that have got more saturated than unsaturated fat, like uh, coconut oil, but as a whole food group. So you'll notice there that I did not mention meat. I did not say that meat has got more saturated than unsaturated fat, because it hasn't. Meat, start with, so this is a slide that I present at, at conferences and we can put this in your show notes if you can create a visual yeah. of a sirloin steak and I colour 71% of it water um, because that's basically what it is. You should take food uncooked so that you're not taking into account how you've cooked it. So your 100 gram sirloin steak, 71, typical steak taken from the US Department of Agriculture database, 71% water, 71 grams of water. Then you've got 21 grams of protein. So after water, steak is predominantly protein. Then you've got little bits of ash and minerals, but then you've got about seven grams of fat in this particular typical steak. And of those seven grams, two are saturated and the rest are unsaturated. Because one of the other interesting facts about facts, I should have done the third one, which is that every food that contains fat, which remember is everything other than sugar, contains yeah. all three fats. So they all contain saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. So even though lettuce contains the, the tiniest amount of fat, there will be some saturated fat in there. And I can show you a picture. They used to put fat on the box on strawberries. 
and they would show that there was a trace of fat and they would show that there was actually a trace of saturated fat as well which i just think is hilarious so they oh know i know so there's a trace of that in everything so of those seven grams of fat out of 100 two are saturated so saturated fat is literally the last thing that that steak is now sure i can get you a fatty lamb and there is more saturated fat than two grams but it is still not the majority still your main thing is going to be water if you do get a really fatty meat and you manage to get more fat than protein there will still be more unsaturated fat than saturated fat because the only food group that's got more saturated than unsaturated is dairy products. Those are nutritional facts. They just are. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, let's move on to red meat um, because I would love for us, we have a couple of guys talking about the carnivore diet, Anthony Chafee, Sean Baker. I'd love to debunk the popular belief that red meat is inherently harmful to health. What does the latest research suggest? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a quote because there, there's a quote yes. for me that just absolutely nails it. And it was about uh, by a guy called um, Surgeon Captain Peter Cleave, and he lived in the last century. And he said, for a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food, so for anything we've got today to yeah. be related to meat, which is one of our heritage foods, is one of the most ludicrous things I've ever heard in my life. And that to me just completely blows it out of the water. How can you possibly blame the most ancient food, which is us running after animals? Look at cave paintings on the walls. You know, they're not running after a lettuce, are they? They're running, there's a little picture of the man with the spear and he's running after this little stick animal. Um, and and it, it just makes no sense. So that, that's the quick rebuttal. That, that's the rebuttal for the vegan in the CrossFit box. So that's the quick one. Right, the evidence. This is what I do. Yeah. You know that. This is what I do. For, yes. for 11, 12 years now, every Monday, I've been doing a note where I take an academic yes. paper, I take a topic, and I just look at all the evidence on that topic. And I've looked at all the evidence for red meat. And every time the International Association for Research on Cancer or the American Guidelines, every time they come out with something new and it's saying red meat causes cancer, I go and look at the evidence. So... First of all, another absolute, because I like absolutes, um, there is no RCT evidence against red meat whatsoever. So that's randomized controlled trial evidence. So that's, before we get into things like systematic review and meta-analysis, that's the, the, the best kind of evidence that we can yeah. have. And it's the kind of evidence that can show cause and effect, not just association. There's none. You just do not find RCTs where they say, right, there's a thousand people and what they're going to do is eat red meat for the next two years and those guys are going to do the plant-based diet for the next two years. We're starting to get that kind of evidence because we've got people like um, the carnivore group. Um, but then all that you yeah. can do with that is what we would call a case control study. So you can yeah. say, right, give me a thousand carnivores and let's match them for age and sex and other characteristics and compare them with a thousand omnivores or a thousand plant-based eaters. But you're into association studies then. Yeah. So then I've also looked at all the association study evidence and I've got, again, I can send you this in the show notes yeah. where I've, I've meticulously gone through the US Nutritional Library on the evidence that they use for the dietary guidelines for Americans. First of all, they don't even have a category for red meat. They look at animal protein. So I went through and they looked at animal protein with heart disease, animal protein with diabetes, animal protein with this cancer, animal protein with that cancer. So I went through the whole damn lot and there is just nothing. Either they didn't even look at red meat. So when you get into it, the animal protein was eggs. Um, it wasn't red meat. It's like, okay, so I can ignore that. And the eggs, they didn't find any issues either. Or they did look at red meat and they found no associations whatsoever. So I just, I went through it absolutely meticulously, subject by subject, absolutely nothing whatsoever. Oh, that That's is awesome. absolutely criminal. Okay, let's switch yeah. to fat. So there, I mean, there, for the longest time, right, there's this prevalent belief that most doctors are quite hardcore about that dietary fat must be restricted for optimal health. Yeah. How does this myth, because I do believe it's a myth, compared to actual scientific data? Well, this, this is my home turf now, because this yeah. is my PhD. So my PhD was basically um, at the top of the evidence pyramid. So you've got sort of, you know, case studies and then case control studies. Blah, blah, blah. You go up to sort of randomized controlled trials. 
you go up to association studies, and then you get up to things like systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the other studies. So you just pull in together all the evidence. And, and that's my, area, my main area of expertise. So I can really look at a whole topic yeah. systematically. So I looked at the dietary guidelines and when they were introduced, which was around 1977 in the US, around 1983 in the UK, and I said, right, I'm going to look at all the randomised control trial evidence and all the system, the um, association studies evidence, and I'm going to do it in this systematic review, meta-analysis kind of way. And then the novelty of the PhD was, I said, I'm, I'm going to do it at the time. So I'm going to do it as if I lived in 1977 and 1983. So I'm going to say, if I was on the committee at the time, what decision should I have come to? And then I'm going to say, OK, well, I'm not doing my PhD in, in 1983. I'm doing my PhD in 2016. So what does the evidence say now? And the, the short story is all four bits of research. So looking at it then, looking at it now, RCTs, association studies, four meta-analyses, systematic reviews, nothing. Just nothing. Just absolutely nothing. And the first paper, which was the arguably the most important one so it was looking at the randomized controlled trials at the time which is what they should have based the dietary guidelines on and that paper went nuts it came out just before your conference in south africa yeah. um, and i was really under horrible pressure then because the backlash i was getting i, I was getting that. abuse i was getting emails i was getting people trying to get dirt on me because they couldn't attack the arguments they were just trying to attack me just such a horrible time but the actual research had been properly covered by time magazine sydney morning herald new zealand times in the uk new york Times. i mean it was just nuts but the most interesting thing about all of that research was there were only six studies and we changed dietary guidelines the americans went first and then the whole world just followed so you lot ruined it for everyone no, of um, course. but there were only six studies they only involved men so women had never been studied. Oh. Nobody knew what this low fat stuff was going to do to women. The men were all sick. They all had already had heart disease. There were fewer than two and a half thousand of them. And the study still concluded that there was no evidence for changing this. And it was even worse. So in the last paragraph of almost every study, there was a caution. So one of them said the low fat diet has no place in the treatment of myocardial infarction, which is heart attacks. Another one said, um, we're very concerned about the potential toxicity of our intervention, which was giving people vegetable oils instead of saturated fats, in effect, butter, which is rich yeah. in saturated fats, so they're swapping one out for the other. And, and I mean, like, they tested on a few men who were already sick, no women, and none of the studies actually said, right, we need to change something and we changed dietary guidelines at the time for a couple of hundred million people and since there's probably been a billion people affected by this low fat nonsense there was no evidence at the time and there's been no evidence since it makes no sense that fat is bad for us it just doesn't oh gosh this is, uh, yeah i mean it's it's so frustrating it's so awful i actually had somebody just to go off on a tangent real quick the other day talked to me about the rice study Ah, Can I did a note on that the other day. I went back and I read your right <laughs> note because it infuriated me to such a yeah. point that he was claiming that, you know, this rice study meant that to be healthy, you only really had to, you could eat pure carbohydrates and sugar. Yeah, yeah. And he was whipping people and he was using one of the subjects as a sex what? slave. Or, he, was, he was whipping people. There was a lawsuit. He was physically whipping people. So if you didn't stick to this diet, and it was something like 800 calories, it wasn't just the, that it was rice and sugar and and that was about it. He, he, it was calorie limited as well. Now, we all know that in the short term, yeah, if you calorie restrict people, it doesn't really matter what they eat. They can eat yeah. 800 calories of olive oil or 800 calories of pure sugar. In the short term, you will lose weight. And then we've seen this with the France study from um, 2007, Marion France's brilliant study. You dip at the bottom at about somewhere between six and 12 months and then you just start regaining and then you actually break through where you were before you started the diet. It's absolutely well known. Um, yeah. So these people, we didn't see, he was trying to say, oh, at two years, um, a number of 40%, I think it was, of people had still kept it off. 
but there were lawsuits and there, there was one woman took him to court and said he'd used her as a sex slave and there was an out of court settlement and then um, other, he, he was allegedly whipping, literally flogging people. And if you, and you had to check in every day. So every day you checked in, you had your blood pressure checked, you were weighed, you were counselled. Um, if your weight wasn't going in the right direction, you were put up on the notice board and everyone was going into the same place to get weighed. So it'd be like, look, Karen didn't lose any weight yesterday. Right, there's a big red circle next to Karen. We're going to shame Karen. Karen's been a greedy bitch. I mean, it was this oh kind of... God. I know, it was outrageous. So um, this idea that, oh, maybe sugar and rice is not so bad for you. It's like, no, maybe if you've got some, you know, nut job who's, yeah. who's <laughs> like some... <laughs> Sadomasochist. Sad yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who's, who's shagging some of the women or whatever. It's like, you know, maybe that might might help you know you stick to the diet but i mean you and i both know you know 800 calories of sugar or rice we would be raging starving all day i would be raging a lunatic yeah so upset and so angry yeah but i mean 800 calories of ribeye it's like mm, i'd like another ribeye but hey that's not bad you know i can probably yeah. make it through the day totally. yeah so wow. yeah that was that was what was going on with the rice diet so i did a post on that so um I think yeah. we should link that as well because that was very yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. for me to read for sure. Are you sure. making a note of these or shall I make a note of these? Don't Rice you worry. I I will send you everything <laughs> I need. It's so organized. Great. My head's on a beach, remember? So, <laughs> Well, I actually have really great people helping me, so I can't take all the credit. Um, let's look at the association between cholesterol and heart disease. Um, because this has been such a huge focus in health discussions. Can you elaborate on where this connection might have been misunderstood? Because misunderstood, it really has. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll try to do the, the, the short story on that. And again, as part of my PhD, my whole PhD is, is on my website. This is what you call chapter two of the PhD. So the chapter one is this is what I'm going to do. Chapter two is what we call the review of the literature. So in the review of the literature, I had to go back to say, why did we even get the idea that dietary fat was bad for us? Why, why did we, you know, where did the whole sort of diet heart hypothesis come from? And of course, then you go back to the beginning of the last century around the 1900s and you had some Russian pathologists who were looking at men, and again, it was men, who had died suddenly. So they're pathologists, so they cut people up and they would notice that there were there was sort of damage internally to the arteries and so on. And then around the damage of the artery, there'd be sort of collections of, of fatty deposits. And cholesterol, of course, was among these fatty deposits. So they started to hypothesize, is cholesterol the cause? It's, it's something that we're seeing at the same time, but it, is it actually the cause? Yeah. Um, and the best analogy that I've heard in this is, you know, if, if there's a fire, you've got the firefighters who attend the fire. They didn't cause it. They're there to clean it up. So yeah. just because you see cholesterol at the scene of the damage doesn't mean it was the cause of the scene of the damage. And actually, of course, cholesterol is one of our major lipids that is um, transported around the body in lipoproteins because the body wants um, the, the things that are carried in lipoproteins are cholesterol, protein, phospholipids and triglycerides. And the body wants them to travel around the body to go to those areas yeah. of damage to, to drop off their vital cargo to repair the damage. So, of course, if there is arterial damage, you're going to find cholesterol and phospholipids and those four things. But they're not there to cause the damage. They're there to heal the damage. So these pathologists, they kind of just went down the wrong track. And then they started, um, they were doing all these other experiments. So they, they took rabbits at the time. And they were trying to they were trying to then test if it was causal. Okay, we're seeing cholesterol, we're seeing damage. Is is this causal? Um, so they would give um, purified cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, to rabbits. But anyone who knows anything about animals and food, um, so rabbits are herbivores. They are vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. And the only foods that contain cholesterol are animal foods. Yeah. So humans have cholesterol. Animals have cholesterol. So it is true that you do not get any dietary cholesterol on a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, because the only foods that contain cholesterol are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Um, but dietary cholesterol makes no difference to blood cholesterol anyway and even Ansel Keys agreed with that so then yeah. we move forward about 50 years Ansel Keys comes in he's just done the Minnesota starvation experiment which was brilliant one of my favorite experiments of all time 
he was the man of the moment he did a great job on that one and then he wanted to stay being the man of the moment so he's like oh i want to find out what causes heart disease i remember what these russian doctors were up to i think probably it's cholesterol and then there was this whole sort of hypothesis of yeah. um and first of all he thought does cholesterol directly cause heart disease and then he did these um graphs and you've probably seen them that sort of famous six countries graph it's not yep. the, don't don't get it confused with the seven countries study so many people make that mistake there was just a six countries graph i've got a blog post on that as well but he left out about 14 other countries and then when you put them all in together it really wasn't a very good association but at the time he did that he was saying oh i think there's something going on between fat and heart disease it's like well make your mind up is it cholesterol and heart disease is it fat and heart disease so then in comes the seven countries study which started in 1956 seven countries japan america yugoslavia greece um poland uh, sorry not um finland um and um he he then starts looking at again it's an association study so he's looking at men in those countries never women again um what are they eating what are their blood cholesterol levels and the most he concluded at the end of that was there seems to be an association he'd given up on fat by then so he went in thinking fat causes heart disease by the end of the seven country study he said actually no there's not an, even an association between fat and heart disease but i am seeing an association between saturated fat and heart disease and there's a little bit of something going on with cholesterol and saturated fat so it's all kind of this trilogy of association and to him saturated fat was ice cream and cake it's like okay yeah they include oh. saturated fat. yeah seriously if you read and i've read every word of the 20 volumes of the seven countries i was obsessed with it i nearly did my oh phd my on the seven countries study then i'm like no i'm just going to use that as background i'm going to do my phd on this whole dietary fat thing but i bloody love that seven country study and you read <laughs> i i know what they were eating in every country i was reading every, and like what do you mean ice cream and cake is saturated <laughs> fat that's sugar that's carbohydrate you know have you damned carbs with no. with saturated fat with heart disease you know what have you exactly done here um but that's where it all came about so anyway wind forward we we then have this massive belief that cholesterol causes heart disease. Now, the body is making cholesterol right now. Our bodies are both making yeah. cholesterol. Cholesterol is so utterly life vital, we would die instantly without it. So if, if you were able to remove all the cholesterol from the body in one nanosecond, you'd have no cells, you'd have no cell structure. We would literally be a puddle on the floor. We, we'd just cease to exist. So this thing is so utterly life vital and yet, allegedly at some magic number which in the uk is five or whatever and for you i think it's about i don't know one nine seven or something like that suddenly it's a, a, a deadly killer i mean that just doesn't make sense it just makes no sense whatsoever the body's make you know the body's making something that's trying to kill you yeah every other aspect of the body the body is the most miraculous thing it keeps your ph level within a nanosecond of what it needs to be it keeps your blood pressure unless you do bad things it keeps that where it needs to be it keeps your temperature where it needs to be you know it's life-threatening if our temperature deviates more than in celsius a degree or so it, it does all these magnificent things and then at the same time it's making something that's trying to kill us and something in every single food that we eat even lettuce and strawberries is is trying to kill us this just makes no sense so the graphs i need to send you for this point is i did some research in 2010 I found some World Health Organization data for 192 countries and I just plotted all the countries. I said, right, what is their average cholesterol level? What are their deaths first from heart disease? And then what are their deaths from all cause mortality? And you've got to see the graphs to believe them. They go down. So the higher your cholesterol, the lower the mortality. The lower your cholesterol, the higher mortality. That holds for men and women, heart disease and all deaths. And Malcolm Kendrick said he he showed that to somebody. He loved those charts. Ufi Ravenskoff loved them as well. Oh, but Ufi yeah. Blessing, he managed to get them published. I updated them for him and we managed to get them oh. published in an academic paper in 2020. So if you want an academic reference, they are in an that. academic yeah. peer review paper. So Malcolm shows this to a doctor and the doctor just glanced at it. He's like, oh my God, it's even worse than I thought. And Malcolm's like, no, it's going the other way. It's not going the way you think it is. And this doctor's like, yeah, whatever, and then just walks off. I mean, they just can't, they can't let it go. It's mad. No, it's just, 
cognitive dissonance, right? They cannot yeah. challenge these beliefs that they've been taught because what yeah. would that mean about everything that they've been taught, right? That it's 100%. all been wrong. 100%. Um, okay, I want to just, we have, you have covered this a bit, but what evidence challenges the widely accepted idea that saturated fat directly causes heart disease? I mean, again, you've got the, you've got the basic principle of that would be insane that nature has provided <laughs> I love food so and every single food contains at least a trace right. of saturated fat and the things that contain the nutrients you know let's cut to it that where we get the nutrients that we need yeah. vitamins the minerals the essential fats are meat fish eggs and dairy and and they contain healthy amounts of fat i mean it would be insane but again of course i got a great chart for this so there's some fantastic european data and it was kind of like that cholesterol 192 country data, but there's some European data published by people who love this sort of thing. 44 countries, and you can plot the level of saturated fat intake versus deaths from heart disease, and again, it is inverse. And think about it, the countries with the highest saturated fat intake in Europe, you'll know this, it's the, it's the dairy-eating countries, so it's places yeah. like Switzerland, um, France, massive intake of cheese cream butter red Delicious. meat yeah you know i've just been in the mediterranean for two weeks i've been trying to find a whole grain you know there is no whole grain in the mediterranean this mediterranean diet is just complete fiction so this chart just directly proves it and then you look you look at the top seven countries in europe with the highest saturated fat intake they are the seven countries with the lowest heart disease and you reverse it, you take the countries with the lowest saturated fat intake and they are the seven countries with the highest rates of heart disease. It's just completely inverse. It's the opposite of what they're telling us. Oh, let's move on to whole grains because this is <laughs> one of our favorite <laughs> topics, right? I mean, the whole grains form the base of this food pyramid, this the most awful food per pyramid, and they are seen as the cornerstone of, of a healthy diet. Let's talk about this and the pitfalls of this notion. Yeah, so get the facts. You know, let, let, let's not have this opinion, let's not have this plant-based nonsense, let's just get the facts. And I presented this chart back at your conference in 2015, and I remember Prof Noakes was there in the front row, and he was like, scribbling away, and then um, they did a, a kid's follow-up to the Real Meal Revolution, and he said, can I put your chart in my book? Because he Aww. just loved it. He's like, this just completely slays it. So what I did, I did a little table and I take foods that I know to be healthy. So I take liver. I mean, if you ever want to win yes. a nutrient competition, you just pick liver. I hate it, it's disgusting, but you win any nutrient competition. So I think I took liver, oily fish, um, sunflower seeds maybe, eggs or dairy, something like that. Um, you, you take what you know to be healthy and then you take whole grains. And you take per 100 grams of product. And again, you should always compare food by raw weight because then it yeah. doesn't really matter what's happened to the cooking but then you can also do it by calorie just to be fair so it's like okay 100 calories of liver versus 100 calories of whole grains and i take the healthiest whole grains that i can whether that's brown rice or porridge oats are generally quite good lentils are actually one of the the best plant foods that you can eat so i really take the best things that i can and i just put down the nutritional facts so i say right there's 13 vitamins that we need there's nine water soluble vitamins there's the four fat soluble vitamins you can argue about how many um, minerals are essential but it's probably around 15 to 20 and we know them iron calcium zinc copper iodine all of that kind of thing so you just go to the u.s department of agriculture database you put in 100 grams of the product you do a nice little spreadsheet on excel and you put in the nutrients and then you circle the one that has the highest nutrient for each of those things. So you go retinol, liver, B1, liver, B2, liver. I mean, it's just liver just wins on all of them. And if yeah. you wanted to knock liver out, it would then be the oily fish. So it would be calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, um, your essential fatty acids in the form that the body wants them. Because yeah, of course, yeah. plants don't have the nutrients in the form that we want them. They don't have B12, they don't have retinol. They don't have D3, they don't have heme iron, they don't have zinc in the absorbable form and all that kind of thing. That's the facts. The fact that whole grain cannot compete. They just cannot compete. You will not win any nutrient competition on whole grains. So why are they telling us to base our meals on whole grains? And of course, Belinda Fetke was the one who I think has done the most brilliant work in this area. Yeah. Check out some of her presentations online. Because she said, you can trace this back to Kellogg, 
um, Sylvester Graham, I think it was, John Harvey Kellogg, when they were trying to get people to eat their whole grain cereals or even yeah. their sugary cereals. And they were the ones that said, well, you should always have breakfast because, of course, people think of breakfast as cereal. So this whole myth has been in the offing for at least 100 years and traces back to big business, big, big food companies that want us to eat their products. There's no margin in Greek yogurt or in um, a grass-fed, you know, Joel Salatan's kind of meat or something. Massive margin on cereal. You put it in a box, you put a toy in, you do the advertising, appeal it to kids or whatever. I mean, you can, you know, 10 times what it actually costs you to make. You can charge yeah. people for this for this nonsense. So that's that's what's going on with whole grains. Oh, it's criminal. It's, it's, I mean, I, I heard the stuff that Gary and Belinda Fecky were talking about. And I mean, so much driven in religion and yes. shaming and, you know, just there's so much to this. Um, that's so fascinating to dig into. Let's move on to fiber, though. So recommendation, we consume 25 to 30 grams of fiber. We've heard how people talk about fiber being like little brooms that sweeps the colon. How <laughs> does this guideline stand up to scrutiny, to scrutiny? And are there any nuances we should be aware of? Oh, gee. I mean, if you want to Google my name and fiber, there is, there is a really funny presentation that I did at Low Carb Denver. And I just thought... <laughs> You know, these oh. poor guys are in a dark room with no daylight, with jet lag. I had the worst jet lag of all. I was like eight oh, hours no. out of my time zone. And you're in here in half an hour presentations, one after the other from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. I got to entertain you. I got to try to make you laugh. So <laughs> I do try to like I'm, I'm a little bit jokey and tongue in cheek and disrespectful and all that. But hopefully I kept them awake for half an hour. I mean, mm. in any other walk of life, where is waste a good idea? <laughs> it's a it's it's a waste product isn't it? it it's the bit that the body we cannot digest fiber you know if you go back to sort of carbohydrate 101 um and you've got your monosaccharides so you've got your sort of glucose um fructose galactose you've got your disaccharides you've got your polysaccharides you know if you go to what actually is fiber it is an indigestible polysaccharide that is another term for fiber so you can't digest it and polysaccharide means many sugars so many sugars that you can't digest. That doesn't really sound like a good idea to me. No. It's a waste product. The body has got to get rid of it. And why is it then a good idea to give your body a lot of stuff that it's got to get rid of? I mean, it just makes no sense to me. Um, and, and you know, it's for this cleansing your colon. I mean, yes. we've been around for, I don't know, since Ostroplasius Lucy first walked upright or whatever. You know, since when was little scrubbies scrubbing your colon ever I think, again, this is just complete bullshit made up by companies who make fruit and fibre and all bran. And all bran is one of the worst Marketing. products that yeah. you can eat because bran tastes so disgusting. You've got to put in a lot of sugar to make it even palatable. So in these high bran fake products, I mean, all bran is like 20% sugar last time I looked. Um, this is so bad. So what happens in these, in, in these I mean, there's no... Um, randomized controlled trials where they've actually said oh look there's people on fiber and they've done so much better there is a brilliant randomized controlled trial where people were having terrible irritable bowel syndrome problems yeah. and they took them all off fiber and all of their problems cleared up everything diarrhea constipation discomfort bloating um pain everything cleared up and then they said to them do you want to go back to fiber and most of them said no i'm not going back to fiber that was clearly what was causing the problem so they don't have RCTs on, oh, eat loads of fiber and you're going to live longer. So what what they have at best, again, are these association studies. So they have these association studies where they say, oh, people who eat um, lentil, uh, lentil stew and um, hummus and, um, you know, uh, kumquat or whatever and quinoa and kiwi fruit and macadamias and all this kind of thing you know they tend to live longer than people who eat you know buy one get one free burger king and you know dunkin donuts and whatever and it's like well of course they do but you've described a healthy person you know visualize 
what kind of person, and again, I have these two pictures that I put up, put up in presentations, and I've got this family where this woman looks like Gwyneth Paltrow and her husband looks like Brad Pitt, and these two little children look like they're out of some sort of, you know, little clothing catalogue or something, and they all look so lovely, and they're all having these, you know, sort of healthy whole grains for breakfast and some orange juice and some fruit. And then you've got this obese couple who are in the burger restaurant, and it's like, okay, so let's let's be really brutal about that which is the healthy family okay so it's the one with the you know the, the, the breakfast table or whatever but they're just a healthy family and healthy people tend to eat fruits and vegetables and legumes and all that kind of thing because they can afford to exactly you know, nuts are expensive quinoa is expensive meat eat everything kind of, yeah totally so the unhealthy people are the ones having the buy one get one free and the buy one get one free in the supermarket is always on the rubbish food and the biscuits and the soft drinks and the burgers and, and all of that kind of thing. So healthy people eat healthy things. The healthy things are not making them healthy. They're really not. And the challenge to this is to say, okay, so take that obese couple in the burger restaurant where you've got this really visual striking image and say, right, I'm going to add in some whole grains to your diet. I'm going to give you a bit of kumquat and quinoa and all that kind of thing. It's not going to make a damn bit of difference. It's just not. If that's the only change that you make to their world and they still can't afford health care and they still might live in a really downtrodden place and they still haven't got a great job and they still don't necessarily have great purpose in life and maybe they don't get quality sleep because they're in a really noisy neighbourhood or whatever and they don't exercise, they don't have the time to, and they've got low income and they have stress because of their life circumstances... Honest to God, a whole grain is not going to make any difference. It just isn't. No, absolutely not. Let's switch on to the eat five a day, where we talk about um, fruit and vegetables. Yeah, that that is just one of the best myths. And the idea that out of this complete and utter myth, you actually have five a day jobs. So you have five a day coordinators. You have five a day project managers. You know, there are states in the US and there are... In the UK, you will have your, your health trust that has this five-a-day called, it's like having a tooth fairy coordinator or, you know, Father <laughs> Christmas project manager. It's just, it's just a complete and utter myth. So it actually originated around near you. So it's from California. Okay. Um, it, it came, um, it came, this is from my research anyway. It, it was first coined in 1991. It has been trademarked by the American National Cancer Institute. So they're the ones who actually have yeah. the trademark to five a day. Yeah, so there was this meeting in California and they had a bunch of companies there. Um, and they were all companies that had an interest in us eating more fruit and vegetables. So it might have been the potato company, the blueberry company, or it was the logistics yeah. companies that were transporting fruit and veg. McDonald's was there. Don't know why they were there. They, I mean, they do that kind yeah. of stuff as well. But you can imagine, and I'm only hypothesizing this, that they get to the end of this meeting and people are like, oh, we've had a great meeting. We need to have an outcome. Oh, let's um, let's get people to eat a certain number of fruit and veg every day. Oh, what a great idea. Like how many? Oh, two. Oh, that's not ambitious enough. Um, seven. Oh, that's a bit too ambitious. Five. That's the number of digits on one hand. That's perfect. Five. Let's go for five a day. And that's where five a day is born. And, and anyone, prove me wrong, tell me. I mean, I've heard another anecdote where somebody who was head of the obesity forum in the UK said he thought it came about in the back of a taxi in a conversation in Brussels, but it, it his date was later than 1991, and I know I can trace it back to 1991. Again, if you want to check it out on my site, zoeharkham.com, go put in five a day in the search box. I think this is called five a day, the truth, and it goes back to how it all came about. And then I asked the question, okay, so it was made up, but I mean, is that necessarily a bad thing? And my conclusion is, yeah, it is a bad thing. But, you know, so many reasons. One, because you're lying to us. Um, another thing is because imagine if they'd have embedded in all of our brains a really useful message instead of, you know, everyone can mention, can, can relate to five a day. But imagine if we'd have said all those years ago, eat real food. That's the only thing you need to do, eat real food and then actually choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. So eat mostly red meat, oily fish, full fat dairy, eggs, especially the yolks, some, maybe some nuts and seeds and some green things, but that's what you need. Imagine if that had been the message. Fruit is mostly sugar. Yeah. It's got a few nutrients, but way less than people think. It's a binge food for a lot of people. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, you know, give me a, a, I mean, dates have got more sugar than toffee. 
you know, yeah. sit me down with my dual dates. You know, I did a conference in Israel and I did a conference in Saudi Arabia and everywhere you go, they give you these bloody med dual dates. It's like, you know, <laughs> you might as well just put cocaine in front of, <laughs> I was going to say Johnny Depp, but don't sue me. I'm sure he's never done cocaine. I mean, they are, they are crack cocaine <laughs> to someone with a sweet tooth. I'm oh, like, oh, I just have cane. one. Yeah. Oh, just remember what they taste like. And then I'm like, oh my God, they're so good. And then I just yeah, like, another. Yeah. 10 dates later I've had the equivalent of like 400 grams of sugar I'm like you know some I'm like wired like some cartoon character so no sugar, <laughs> fruit is is I love fruit don't get me wrong and I do eat fruit but I don't kid myself that it's healthy I have to limit it because I could yeah. go nuts on it and I have to go mm. for the lower sugar fruits yeah um it's like I've got apples and pears in my garden at the moment because it's autumn in the UK and they've been blackberries in the hedgerow and they're not sweet, so that's okay. Um, yeah. Because I can't binge on them because they're really dense, not sweet. They're not like American Red Delicious. No, um, or like the quite... grapes that you get here. They're called cotton candy grapes. Yeah, 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 totally. It's crazy. Okay, what about the... This is my favorite one. <laughs> and it was used a lot like in political campaigns eat less and do more or eat less oh, move God. more so what about this approach to, to weight loss yeah. yeah i mean we would not be here today if we had not managed to eat more and do less uh, that's the only reason we're here today we found a way to get enough calories and to not expend more calories than we took in otherwise yeah. we'd have died out so we are hardwired to eat more and do less so the first thing that happens and you and i have both done this so we know this from experience we have both at various periods in our life tried to eat less and do more okay yes so the first thing that happens when you eat less is your body tries to get you to eat more that's the first thing that happens so you think yeah. about food all day long you're hungry you're cranky you're irritable your body even like gives your hand a little shake because it's actually trying to give you a signal you need to, you can't concentrate on stuff, you need to go get some food. So it will try to get you to eat more. That's the first thing it will do. And it will also then try to get you to eat less. Uh, sorry, to do less. So if you don't do put enough yeah. in. Spend less energy, yeah. And then you try to go down the gym, your body just goes, oh, I just don't have the energy. Just don't even yeah. go near the gym. Just sit on the sofa. So the very first thing that happens is it just tries to counteract the opposite so if you have the willpower of a monk and if you manage to stick to this eating less and you try to do some exercise and doing more and most people can do it for a few weeks especially your first one if it's like your hundredth calorie control diet you, it's really not so good but for your first one you can kind of manage it so then they have this idea that the body is just gonna release the difference so it's just gonna go all right here's some body fat um, I'm just going to release the difference to make up for that calorie deficit, which is what the dieter wants to happen. And then we could have done another myth, but I mean, that's for a whole other day, which is this whole nonsense of one pound equals three and a half thousand calories. If only you can make a deficit of three and a half thousand calories, you will lose one pound of body fat and you will not. Um, I mean, if that were the case, you'd lose a hundred pounds in a year, cutting back by a thousand calories a day. And I'm only about a hundred and eight pounds seven pounds i don't know whatever i'd be dead you know i'd be like seven yeah. pounds <laughs> i'd <Yeah>. be like <laughs> but it's, it's nuts it just doesn't work so that's a whole other one um but if you do manage to eat less and do a little bit more the body's just not going to go oh there you go there's a pound of fat the body is going to do everything it can to preserve body fat because it sees that as a life-threatening situation so again, the body's just going to try to get you to eat more. It's going to try to get you to do less. It's just going to compensate in other ways. It will not play this game that you want it to play. And then the body, when you start doing it and you persist at doing it, the body's like, right, there's things I can do because you're now putting me into a dodgy situation. So you look at the nine systems of the body. So you've got things like the reproductive system, the lymphatic system, the skeletal yeah. system, cardiovascular system, all the rest of it, lymphatic drainage. So the body would just say, right, I'm turning some of those off. So the first things that go, women know there's your periods. The body says reproductive yeah. system is now not needed. This person is not eating enough to look after themselves. So there is no way that we're going to let them make another human being because they're already in a life threatening situation. So period stop. We do not need to reproduce. Yeah. Um, you start growing fine hair on your body because the body is going to find another way of keeping you warm and you're cold the whole time. Yeah. So you're wearing jumpers in the summer um, and you can't function and your body's literally just shivering. It, 
shuts down the lymphatic drainage system. So you get people have this like this car puffy face because they're not eating enough. So they don't yeah. look like they've got glowing skin. The body yeah. is just not operating in the same kind of way. Of course, it starts damaging the skeletal system. So it will start robbing nutrients from yeah. bones. You're going to set yourself up for things like osteoporosis in later life. Um, it's not going to nourish muscles. It just it's going to do you so much harm. The idea that the body's just going to go, there you go, there's a pound of fat. It doesn't. It will just go into protection mode, starvation mode, get you to eat mode. And at some point, the body will win. I, it's really, I'm going to say something really, this is true, but it's really harsh here. Anorexia is the only time when the body doesn't always win. And anorexia is the mm. highest death rate of any self-inflicted illness, the most horrific um thing that that people ever do to themselves and the death rate from anorexia is around 20 percent so one in five people will actually win versus the win versus the body and they die the other four times out of five thank god the body will take over and it will force the person to be hungry to start eating and quite often people's way out of anorexia is actually bulimia and they actually get to the point that they're overeating because this is yin and yang isn't it you go to one extreme the body is going to take you to the other extreme so you're at one extreme of of really not eating enough and then the body just takes you to the other extreme of just eating too much and you just don't know how to stop and you're and the only way out of this i mean this is why i wrote that book why do you overeat when all you want is to be slim it was looking at the emotional and the physical reasons for overeating and you've you, you've got to stop one because people would overeat one day and then not eat enough the next day and then binge because they were hungry from the day before and then starve because they regretted the binge from the day before and I would just say to them when I was trying to help people out of this situation you've just got to stop one it doesn't matter which one it is you've got to stop the starving or the binging because one follows the other so if you if you have what you see as a bad day but you can manage not to starve yourself to the next day to say right I'm going to eat sensibly that next day actually you won't want to binge the next day because you didn't starve and you then won't want to starve because you didn't binge. You start getting back into... You've got to move away from that extreme into this middle ground. And you've also got to start reframing what you see as good. So a good day is not a day when you eat 400 calories. That's that's bad thinking. That's what people in, caught up in, in bad sort of situations think of as a good day. It's not a good day. A good day is the day when you give your body what it needs. And you nourish it and you nurture it and you love it and you're nice to it and you give it the meat and the fish and the eggs and the dairy and some green things maybe and you don't give it sugar and crap and you don't eat too much and you don't eat not enough that's that's the good day I love that <laughs> so we focused on like personally and I want to shift to public health with this belief that we have that public health has our best interest at heart can you shed light on these challenges which we have covered in this conversation and also the conflicts that might influence public health recommendations, which we've also focused on, but in conclusion, essentially? Yeah, totally. I mean, they're very stark in the US. They're very stark in the UK. So you've got the whole stuff that we've talked about that Belinda uncovered with the cereal companies. Whenever you look at sort of research, in, research into food, you always see co companies like Unilever, Kellogg's, um, General Mills, organizations that benefit from that terrible pyramid that there used to be in the US with you know the loads of whole grains on the bottom. And then it became the plate during, um, I think Michelle Obama had an Im impact on that whole plate kind of thing. Yeah, um, and that, exercise, yeah. <laughs> that was nuts as well. Fun. But I mean, one of the starkest that I ever found was actually in the UK. So we had something called the Eat Well plate i used to call it the eat badly plate because it was <laughs> it was so bad i saw someone else call it the eat hell plate and i thought yeah that's quite good as well and then they renamed it and they called it the eat well guide but it was essentially oh, the same thing so it's okay. this plate it's got virtually you cannot find meat on it let alone red meat you're really struggling to find any fish you're struggling to find eggs if there's any dairy it's low fat it's really clearly low fat and then there's just a mass of fruits and vegetables which just aren't bringing that many nutrients to the table massive whole grains which again as we've we've explained are not bringing nutrients so in the uk i thought like where do they get this thing from and it come from public health england so this was in 2016 when they updated it as the guide and i went back to look at the panel that had put it together and the panel had been appointed by public health england 
and there were 11 members of the panel and eight of them were basically representatives of the fake food industry. Um, and you had like a dietitian. I mean, dietitians are conflicted anyway, as we know. Yeah. They're also sponsored by the fake food industry. I think there was a, a nurse or something, but she obviously couldn't sway against, you know, most of the yeah. panel. Um, but you had the Institute for Grocery Distribution or something, the Association of Convenience Stores, which is like your 7-Elevens. Um, and they don't sell anything healthy, as we all know. Um, you had the Food and Drink Federation, who are all about, you know, pushing fake food. It was just the representatives of the fake food industry and they had been allowed by Public Health England to put together the plate that then determines what the people in the UK are supposed to eat. And you could say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just a plate. You know, people can ignore it. It's up in schools. It's in hospitals. It's how you're supposed to eat in prison. So any public institution has to follow the US guidelines, the UK guidelines, New Zealand, Australia, it's all the same problem. And it's embedded in the school curriculum. So I actually then went and had a yeah. look. So in our schools, at seven, they get taught this particular thing about that plate. And then at nine, they get taught this. And then at 11, they get taught this. So it just gets embedded throughout their career. Yeah. And we run a diet club trying to help people to eat real food. Yeah. And you'll have the mums in it coming home going, oh, you won't believe it. My child came home today saying, mummy, you've got it all wrong. Uh, we should be eating um, pasta and rice and we shouldn't be having so much meat and fish. And like, you know, mums are storming up the school going, this is outrageous. You know, how dare you be doing this to our children? So they do not have, they just don't. They just do not have our better interests at heart. But it then helps you because then, you know, when COVID came along and they're sort of like, oh, lock yourself indoors and don't get any vitamin D and don't go outside and you're only allowed an hour's exercise a day um, and never told anyone about vitamin D, all of this kind of thing. It's like, I already don't trust you. I already don't trust you. So I'm, do I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not going to miss seeing you know i'm not going to miss the social aspect of being a human being which i know is so yeah. vital for health you know i'm not going to lock myself in one bedroom for the next year or so so it actually does help you when you realize these guys do not have your best interest at heart um they just don't they they are thinking about business they're thinking about i don't know a couple of million people in the uk alone who are probably in, in, uh, employed in the fake food industry the fast food industry the delivery industry Starbucks, high street, coffee shops and all the rest of it, they'll be thinking if we actually told people to eat real food and they actually all did it and all of these businesses fell over, that's that's the economy on its on its feet. Gone. So they don't care about us, sorry, but they don't. Oh, Zoe, this has been such an enlightening and fun conversation. <laughs> um, in closing, do you have any parting words or where can people find you? Your newsletter is something I look forward to every week. Aww, it's the best newsletter you. out there without a doubt um, on you. nutrition. So, um, yeah, any closing okay. words? Thank you. Yeah, so I'm on zoeharcom.com, Z-O-E, Z-O-E, you say, don't you? Z-O-E, <laughs> H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E. Um, and then people say to me, what is your dietary advice? And it's really simple, three things. Number one, eat real food. We shouldn't need to call it real food. They should need to call theirs fake food. Number yeah. two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides because then you will choose red meat, oily fish, full fat dairy, eggs, and maybe a few seeds and some green things. And then the rest is kind of what you fancy, but you've got to eat the core. And then the number um, three one is don't eat more than three times a day. Really, really, really try not to eat. I mean, if you don't like breakfast, skip it, fine, have lunch and dinner. But this whole idea that we're just grazing all day long, you know, I say at conferences, unless you are a cow or want to be the size of one, stop grazing. <laughs> <laughs> I probably upset some people there, so we should leave it there, I think. <laughs> Oh my God, Zoe, thank you so much. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being such a dear and great friend to me as well. I'm so oh, grateful for you and my I life. I love you too. I love you. <laughs>